Welcome, everybody, to Friday's Restorative Breath Practice. Um, my name is Angelia. Um, I am usually your breath facilitator, but today I am going to hand the baton to a very interesting um, gentleman that I had the opportunity to get with. Jeez. Oh, that I had the opportunity to get with and begin um, having a conversation about breathing, the journey that I've been on and how I've landed here. And I asked him to come in and give us a presentation that I had seen of his regarding brain health and breathing. So Nick generously and graciously accepted my um, request, and here he is today. I introduce to you um, Nick Heath. He is a PhD, um, and his uh, he has a background in atmospheric science, but he also, for the last several years, has been studying breath work. He is a uh, level one um, pranayama instructor, and he also has completed the Oxygen Advantage program, which is a phenomenal program I have been um, learning about for a couple of years now, something I'd be very interested in completing myself. Um, this gentleman also lives with um, diabetes, and he has brought breath in to his healing path through that avenue. Um, and I thought his brain health and breathing um, uh, presentation, his workshop is is really phenomenal. And I really wanted the opportunity for my group of people that I love you guys so much to have the chance to um, hear some of this wisdom and and maybe begin your own breath practice. We have a lot of new people that I talk to regularly, but they don't tend to land in my group that much. So it's good wonderful to see you here all of you so much we have a lot of people that do come to my groups too so it's so good to see you all and um, i'm going to hand this over to nick real quick let me make you the host oh yeah okay Perfect. there you go my friend okay awesome well thank you angelia and thank you all so much it's uh yeah a complete honor to be here so as she mentioned i got into this through diabetes um and my goal when I learned about all of it, it was just so simple and and so helpful in, in my personal life. And then I started reading about it and trying to understand it a little bit better and realized, oh, there's a lot of science and it helps a lot of different things, not just diabetes. And so it's just been basically my my goal in life to share it with as many people as possible. So I'm honored for your time and, and uh, that you're interested in this. So as I'm going to share screen now, um, there's that. As was alluded, this is a presentation. It's actually typically uh, a two-hour workshop, which I can actually give you all access to a recording of if, if that interests you after this uh, smaller version. But for today, we're going to just chat. It's about an hour total. Um, but please interject anytime with questions, um, basically anything, any you know thoughts you have. Just, just stop me. Um, I can't see everyone. So just, uh, I guess, unmute or, or do one of the little emoji things on there. And I think those will pop up. But um, with that, let me get rid of some of this extra stuff that's in my way. When you share your screen. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So it's titled Breathing for Better Brain Health. And this came about, um, I've just I'm a nerd on all things breathing. And I was reading a lot of uh, books and in, in papers that were that just kept coming back to some of the benefits that uh, breathing had for our brain, and I just decided to put it into a workshop, and I, I got a really positive response from people, and it, and it seemed to be very helpful, and so that's where this came about, and um, yeah, so here's the the three ways it's broken down. So in general, there's a lot of different breathing techniques. There are tons of different ways you can change your breath, but the ones with kind of the most research and the easiest to learn and simplest are mindful breathing, um, nasal breathing, and then specifically we'll be talking about a technique called alternate nostril breathing, which is really, really interesting. 
and then just slow breathing, which is just basically a relaxation technique that, um, that does a lot of interesting things for our brain. So that's the three topics we're going to go around. I'm going to admit somebody. Um, okay. And yeah. And so we'll just go through each one of these. We're going to practice each one as we go and, and then go from there. So we're going to begin with a really short practice of mindful breath awareness. So it doesn't really matter what position you're in. If you want to change and get comfortable, um, you can, but you, you don't have to. Um, I would invite you to close your eyes if you would like, but again, it's up to you. You can just keep your gaze straight or fixated on one point and just become aware of the sensations of your breath. There's no right or wrong. There's no need to change your breath. Just notice it wherever it's most vivid for you. Now try to place a label as you're breathing in. Just think to yourself, breathing in. And as you're breathing out, think to yourself, breathing out. Just continually say that breathing in and breathing out with each breath you take. And if your mind wanders, which it will, that's what our mind does is it thinks thoughts. Just say to yourself, oh, well, and come right back to those breathing in and breathing outwards. We're going to breathing for five today. It just, it just started. Hmm? If you're not cool. muted, please mute yourself. Now you can let go of those labels. Just take one moment to notice how you feel. And then when you're ready, you can just come back to the virtual presentation. So that very, very simple exercise of just noticing our breath, and in this case, labeling it, that, that came from... Uh, uh, Buddhist practitioner Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, he, he just talks about the simplicity of noticing and, and saying, I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out for cultivating mindfulness. But although it's nice for, you know, relaxing us before the presentation, before we get into a bunch of learning, um, it's also our first practice for actually improving our brain health. So what we were doing uh, can be called a mindfulness or mindful breathing push-up. So essentially we're shining our attention on our breath then when our mind inevitably wanders, right? Of course, you're going to think thoughts. It's going to go off. You just notice that and you say, oh, okay. Oh, well, no big deal. And then you redirect your mind back to the breath. Uh, Dr. Amishi Jha is the one who coined this, this idea of calling it a mindful uh, push-up of the mindfulness breathing exercise. And what I like about calling it a mindful breathing push-up is it emphasizes that we need all of these components, right? Just like to get a, a physical workout at the gym, you got to go up and down with the push-ups. Here, th that shining the attention, noticing your mind wandering, and then redirecting it back is critical to getting the benefits. And the other reason it's it's such a good analogy is that similar to physical push-ups, where we go, we try to you know build muscle or get stronger. Mindful breathing push-ups actually do change our brain. So um, it turns out that across a lot of different studies looking at brain imaging and uh, and different things of, of meditators versus non-meditators or people before and after med meditation, if they find that the functioning and the actual structure of different regions of the brain consistently change. So the ones that, uh, that come across most are, are the hippocampus, which is where associated with me memory and emotions, 
the insular cortex, which is perception and control of internal stim internal stimuli like pain, and then the anterior cingulate cortex, which is associated with attention and decision making. And then there's also evidence that it changes the uh, the amygdala, where like the fear and stress response is located, and just in general increases connectivity of the brain. So a lot of things going on. And um, more specifically, Sarah Lazar, a another researcher in this field, she found that imaging a lot of people's brains of meditators versus non-meditators, that the thickness of the cortical region was actually being preserved with age. And so as she says here, it may help slow down or even prevent the normal age-related decline in, in thickness. So gray matter where neurons communicate, it tends to be thicker in people who meditate. So really, really need to see something as simple as literally just paying attention to our breath can actually change our brain and have so many benefits. So um, to summarize it quickly, it's going to engage the key uh, three key cognitive functions, focusing, noticing and redirecting. That's that mindful push up and then change the structure and activity of um of several different important brain regions. So if you did nothing else, uh, just focusing on your breath for several minutes a day could really help with overall brain health. But of course we got a lot more to talk about, right? We still have uh, nasal breathing and slow breathing. So that's the first part. The second one is nasal breathing and then specifically alternate nostril breathing. So I like to bring up studies and, and show you what they did, but hopefully it's, it's really straightforward because I'm not that smart, so hopefully this won't get too technical. But um, so this one was really interesting because they were able to put these little electrodes inside of a person's brain, intracranial EEG, and measure the electrical signals at a really high resolution and see what is going on in people's brains when they breathe through their nose or when they breathe through their mouth. So what they found is that basically when people breathe in and out through their nose, it tends to synchronize oscillations, electrical oscillations across various regions of the brain, including here the piriform cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus, whereas the mouth breathing did not. So actually like in your nose, the olfactory bulb for smelling is like a piece of your brain sticking out and it actually touches the, the air, hits that part of your brain. Um, I think it's there and somewhere in your eyes are the only two parts of your brain that are actually exposed to to nature right um and so what they found is basically the air hitting that part of the brain then transmits those signals across various reason regions now this is not data this isn't real data but this is how i pictured it in my head uh when 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 you're mouth breathing you have all these signals and all these electrical signals and they're all uh, junk uh you know tangled up but when you switch over to nasal breathing it, it brings a little bit of harmony and synchronization to those signals. Um, and why that's important though, right? Does it have any real world impacts? Well, they did show in that same study that it had some impact on emotional recognition. So being able to identify, so like they would flash faces really fast and say, hey, was that person surprised or were they like fearful? And during nasal breathing, they could um, identify them faster, the surprised or fearful. And then they also were able to even come up with correlations between was it better during inhalation versus exhalation? And it turned out that during inhalation, they did better. Um, and, and what was neat about that was that they saw during nasal inhalation that those brain oscillations were most synchronized then. And then that happened to be where they were able to identify the, the emotional faces um, faster. So it just was a really neat study showing some, a little bit of real world application um, and just a need to see the changes in the brain in general. So this one, plus lots of other studies have shown that basically when you breathe through your nose versus your mouth, it synchronizes brain uh, wave oscillations. It improves visuospatial learning and accuracy, and it increases connectivity of the brain. So um, basically different regions and different places start to talk to each other, especially if you do it while you're breathing slowly, um, which is just really neat for something as simple as primarily trying to breathe through our noses if we can. Um, okay, so that's nasal breathing in general, but as I mentioned, the specific exercise for, for brain health that we're gonna practice is alternate nostril breathing. 
And the reason this one is so interesting is that there was this fascinating study showing that alternate nostril breathing improved the learning and retention of motor skills. So here's what they did. Um, they had people draw circles. It was really neat. Uh, so they had 40 participants draw circles on an electronic tablet. From everything I read about it, the basic description I can I, I can I can picture in my head is that they had this tablet. They're drawing these circles, but they can't see their hand. There's like a little you know something blocking the view of their hand, and so they're drawing it and they're looking at a computer screen to see how well they're doing. And so they had these outer bounds. And then the red line is their drawing and they're trying to keep it within those bounds and make a full circle within, I don't know why, but 2.1 seconds uh, is what the, the, the scientists came up with. And what was neat about this though, is that they could measure when they went outside of those bounds, they could quantify the air. And then based on where they finished, they could quantify how far away were they, uh, both in time and space. And so it gave them a way to actually measure how well they were learning how to draw these these circles without seeing their hand. So they did this a hundred times, um, just looking at it, going back and forth, you know, it's like perfect for learning, instant results, instant feedback, and they got pretty good at it. After a hundred times, they were doing well. Um, and the researcher said, okay, you got this figured out. Now I want you to take a 30 minute break. So one group just sat relaxed in a quiet room for 30 minutes and another group practiced alternate nostril breathing for 30 minutes. So after that, they brought them all back into the room and they said, okay, let's draw those circles again. And so the people that just relaxed and took it easy, they lost all of their skill. It basically looked like they were starting from scratch again. They, and it took them a long time to get back to where they were. But the alternate nostril breathing group, on the other hand, almost retained their skill perfectly. So they looked almost exactly like they did before the 30 minute break. So basically they retain that skill much better. Something about doing this, this breathing technique helped solidify that, uh, that motor skill learning. But what was even more fascinating is they, then they all went home, you know, they went to sleep, they did their no more thing. And 24 hours later, they just tested them again to see if anything, you know, if there was any long-term learning and this, these changes persisted 24 hours later. So at retest, the alternate nostril breathing group looked good again, and the controls looked bad again. So um, yeah, it was pretty incredible to see that just one 30 minute session of alternate nostril breathing uh, led to at least one full day of, of improved uh, learning and retention of this one motor skill. So I'm not going to ask anyone to do 30 minutes of, of uh, any breathing technique, but um, we will do alternate nostril breathing for about two minutes real quick, just to, to learn it because it is such a powerful technique and one that now other researchers are taking um, to, to look at other uh, brain issues to see if this may help. So um, the, the basic idea uh, is just that you breathe in through one nostril and then out through the other, and then in through that one and out through the other. I'm gonna guide it more slowly, but I just wanted to show you this kind of image to show it's going in one nostril, out the other, and then you go back in that same nostril and out the other. So um, I will walk you through it once. You don't have to practice yet. You can just kind of watch my instructions. And then, uh, when, then we'll go through it all together as a group. So the first thing you wanna do is let's see, you can really use any fingers you want. So I'll just, we'll just make it simple and say, we'll use our thumb and our, and our pointer finger so that you can just easily go back and forth. Um, you can do some other fun things with your hands to, to match the more ancient pranayama techniques, but for, for ease of use, we'll just do our thumb, our right thumb to block our right nostril and our right index finger to block our left nostril. You'll also notice I just press lightly on the outside of my nose, uh, on the soft cartilage here. You don't have to plug your nose up or push it really hard. It's just a really light uh, press against your nose. And if you have any kind of like nasal congestion where it's just impossible, you cannot block it at all. You can just go through the movement of moving your fingers back and forth because uh, I think that's a big part of it is just that, that mental stimulation. So, hey, Nick, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. 
does it matter which side that you are beginning this practice on? Because some people I know are one side deficient. So does it matter if they begin it on the left in or the right in? No. So traditionally you, you begin with an exhale through the left and then inhale through the left okay. and then exhale, right. And then you, you cycle that way. That's traditionally, but th there's no, like, as far as I know, there's no like sound scientific reason for why that would be any more beneficial than starting with a right inhale or a left inhale or a right exhale. So I would say whatever works for you do it. Um, I, when I guide it, I'll start with a left exhale, but if that doesn't work, then just start wherever you can when it, in any part of the cycle. Um, it's just that the, the effort of doing it is what counts, not the, these little specifics as far as I've learned. Yeah. That's a great question though. Thanks. Um, I'll give you another trick. So, um, the best thing I have learned to make this easier is to flip our Western perspective of the breath cycle. So we generally, if you, if you tell someone to take a breath, they inhale and then exhale. But if we think of the breath cycle starting on an exhale instead of an inhale, and the little thing I like to think in my head is to give before we, we receive, right? Let's give something and then receive uh, from, from Mother Nature, right? Uh, so if you give before you receive, then the breath starts with an exhale, then an inhale, then it becomes a really, really simple practice. You, you it, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale exhale, inhale. So it's one breath on the left, one breath on the right, one breath on the left, one breath on the right, back and forth. So if at any point you get like confused, if you try this on your own and you're like, you know, how, which one do I start with? Just think I take one breath left, one breath, right. But the breath I give before I receive, I exhale before I inhale. And that can make it easy anytime to catch up if you get lost in the practice. So we will all do this now. Um, to the best of our abilities, it is really awkward. The first, you know, year of try. I'm just joking. The first few times you try it, it is awkward, but that's that's part of the practice is the the cognitive uh, difficulty. So again, we can just use our right thumb and our right index finger. Take your right thumb and block your right nostril. Exhale through your left. Inhale through your left. Switch and exhale through your right. Inhale through your right nostril. Switch and exhale through your left. Inhale left. Exhale right. Inhale right. Exhale left. Inhale left. Exhale right. Inhale right, exhale left. Inhale left, and exhale right. Inhale right, exhale left. Inhale left and exhale right. Last one, inhale right and exhale left. And you can release your hand down. Notice how you feel if you found that challenging or just nice and relaxing. What I've noticed uh, personally doing this practice a lot is that it, because physiologically in our body, it's calming, it kind of offsets the cognitive difficulty of it. And it kind of just makes it like enjoyable overall. Like it's a, it's just challenging enough to be, to be enjoyable, but with the body relaxation, it's, it's very uh, <clears throat> focusing and, 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 and it feels good at the end, but that is alternate nostril breathing.
at the end of this, we'll do that again um, as part of the the 12 minute practice we're going to do. But just for now, that's the start of it. So I will move on now. Um, let's see. OK, so we are now to the third component of the practice, which is slow breathing. So slow breathing um, is breathing at a rate less than 10 breaths a minute. That's generally like the, the clinical definition of it. Um, it's usually though, when you see it brought, you know, in blog articles or anywhere you look where people say there's like a slow breathing or a resonance breathing or a coherent breathing, there's lots of different words for it. It's usually between like three and seven breaths a minute with the most common being six breaths a minute. Um, and in general, most people breathe about 12 to 18 breaths a minute. So this is a, a significant reduction in our breathing rate, uh, either, you know, in half or even a third or more of our, of our resting breathing rate, how we're breathing spontaneously. So it's a big reduction in breathing. And most of us probably intuitively know, right, when you relax, your breathing just naturally slows down. But what we do when we control our breathing and, and make it slow is we kind of trick our bodies. We do it bottom up. We purposefully breathe slowly. And that tells our brain things are good, we're safe, and that allows us to relax. And so some of the things that happens when we do this is it synchronizes messages between our lungs, so our breathing, our cardiovascular system, and our autonomic nervous system. Uh, it in increases heart rate variability. It's been shown to lower blood pressure. It, it significantly alters our brain waves. And then many other things like lowering oxidative stress and lowering inflammation, improving blood flow, um, and aiding in concentration and attention. There's like a, it, it's a pretty incredible, all the things that, that slow breathing is, that does for our bodies. But I'm going to cover two things that I think are important that you, you all might find interesting. One is its ability to improve executive function. So this study took uh, people and let them watch a neutral TV documentary. That was like the control condition. Uh, and then take a bunch of cognitive tests. And then in another, uh, like a week later, they did the same experiment. Uh, but this time they performed slow breathing and then took the cognitive tests. And then of course it was randomized and some people did this one first and some people did this one first. Um, and what they found though, is after the slow breathing compared to the TV documentary, the participants were uh, improved their inhibition, which basically meant if they were shown this, they were able to say green instead of blue to identify the color, not the word. Um, and so they got significantly better at doing this after the slow breathing practice. Uh, and inhibition is just one factor of executive uh, executive cognitive function in general. They also improved their working memory. So uh, as uh, this is an, another quote from Dr. Amishi Jha, we, we saw with the mindfulness push-up. Uh, she says, working memories where you hold a goal in mind so you can move toward it. So basically, it's a really important thing to have good working memory as you're trying to figure out a solution to things and stuff like that. And so they were able to test show they improved that. And then they also improved their cognitive flexibility. So um, this was just 15 minutes of slow breathing, by the way, um, being able to change perspective uh, spatially or interpersonally. So that was a really... Uh, fascinating thing to see and something I've personally definitely experienced in my life, especially uh, this last one. And then the inhibition being able to like impulse control, right? When you want to say something and then you hold back and, and things like that. So uh, I've definitely experienced some of these in my life, but a, probably a more fascinating uh, study on how it impacts brain health overall was looking at slow, deep breathing and this fluid called cerebral spinal fluid, um, CSF. So uh, cerebral spinal fluid, a clear fluid with many vital roles in the brain, um, delivering nutrients and hormones, removing waste from the brain and providing cushioning. Uh, and so this study in particular was saying, you know, it plays a, a, a critical role in the health of the central nervous system and, and brain diseases. So uh, what they did is they had participants lay in an MRI and perform four different breathing techniques. So one was just plain old slow breathing. Uh, so no instruction on how to just breathe, you know, three to five seconds in, three to five seconds out. That gets us to about that six breaths per minute that we were talking about earlier, about six or seven breaths a minute. Um, another group was uh, told to focus on expanding their belly really big, you know, during inhalation and then relaxing it during exhalation. 
Uh, then they did diaphragmatic breathing. So this was more focusing on trying to expand your ribs with each breath. And then there was chest breathing, trying to breathe into your chest, some more shallow breathing, but, uh, but still taking, you know, large breaths and expanding the chest all around. So what they found is that these breathing patterns increase the flow of cerebral spinal fluid toward the brain by 16 to 28%. So the deep belly breathing was the, had the biggest changes in, uh, 28%. The diaphragmatic breathing, 23, and then slow breathing just by itself was 22%. And then the chest breathing did increase it, but they said this one did not reach statistical significance, meaning it could have just been random uh, chance that that it increased that much. Um, nonetheless, this was really cool uh, and basically suggests that slow breathing may be beneficial to brain health by increasing cerebral spinal fluid to the brain. And this particular pattern of doing like either belly ribs or chest is part of this bigger uh, yogic complete breath that's been practiced for, you know, thousands of years where they try to fill up their bellies, then fill up their ribs and then fill up their chests. And these researchers were just trying to see, is there any, is there any difference between when they're filling up their belly, their ribs or their chest? Does it impact uh, things differently? And could it help explain why yogis have, you know, live longer and all these different things? Um, In any case, it, the reason they came up with uh, that maybe the the deep belly breathing in particular had such a profound effect is that when your when your diaphragm presses down, it basically increases the pressure in your in your stomach region. Uh, so the intra abdominal pressure, the pressure inside your belly goes up, and that basically squeezes the cerebral spinal fluid up your spine and then into into the brain uh, is how I understood it really fascinating. Uh, doesn't really matter how it works, right? But it's really cool to see that. Um, I see a chat, a question. Yes. Uh, Carla, go ahead and unmute, or if you want to type it here, that's fine. I'll just wait one second. Sorry. Can you hear me? Sorry. Oh yeah. Um, I can hear you. Hi. No. So that kind of, so, and I, I was a biology major. I'm trying to think. So what, what normally pushes the cerebral spinal flow anyway? Is it just, you know, the peristaltic motion of your gut around your spine that you know? Well, you're in good company because I don't know exactly either. Uh, my understanding is that the heart and the and the gut play like they both contribute. Um, yeah. And that the respiratory driven component, which is the gut, basically like the, the diaphragm pressing down and increasing intra abdominal pressure is more is plays a bigger role than the cardiac right. uh, component. Interesting. But that, that, that that's my understanding. Yeah. And, so and then when too, you like exaggerate it, like if you're expanding your chest and, you know, so the ribs are pulling, so they're connected to the spine. So they're pulling. So I wonder, I have a couple of doctor friends they're going to be getting some interesting questions this evening. So okay, good. Yeah, I would love to learn I'll more. Know what, uh, I hear what they say? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. That's a an excellent question. Thank you. Okay, so now we get to practice this. Um, so, in general, we're just going to be doing a, a nice slow breathing practice and. I want you to, you don't have to put your hands anywhere, like on your belly or anything, but I just want you to, you know, try to visualize breathing more into your belly region than, than into your chest. So um, that's the first step. We're also going to breathe in through our noses. So, and out through our noses. And if that isn't comfortable, you can exhale through pursed lips, like, like you're blowing on hot soup or hot coffee. But um, try to do it with the nose. But if that if you find that uncomfortable, you can try the pursed lips exhales, and that might uh, help. So in through the nose still, but then out through pursed lips. Both of those are are equally relaxing and effective. But some people find the, the exhales through the mouth slightly more relaxing. So I'll let you choose as you practice. But try with the nose first and see how it goes. So that's the basic instructions. Breathe into your belly breathe through your nose and try not to over exaggerate it. Just try to take, take it nice and easily. So I have some tones here that I'm going to play 
that will guide you. I'll, I'll, I'll speak over the first two or three breaths, and then I'll let you go by yourself. Um, and so I hope you enjoy it. So we'll go ahead and begin now. And we'll start with an inhalation, starting, if I can get this to play, okay, breathe in, breathe out. And exhale. Breathe in. And breathe out. Just continue following the tones the best you can. Doesn't have to be perfect. feels uncomfortable for you at any point, you can just take a break or just stop completely and just focus on your normal breathing. Now you can just return to your normal breathing. Maybe take a moment to notice how your body feels. If you feel more relaxed and calm or any sensations you might feel, some tingling or your hands or feet, just observe it. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that quick two minutes of slow breathing. And if there's no questions yet, I'll move on to the final little part here. Um, let's see. So the last component is to take that first part we said, which was mindfulness and mindful breathing and combine it with slow breathing. So there was a, so basically it's slow breathing, but with uh, a mantra or a focus word is, is the way of putting it. And there was a, a study that looked at basically how did they compare if you breathed at six breaths per minute, or if you breathed at six breaths per minute while repeating a word with each breath you took. And what they found is that the addition of that mindfulness component of needing to focus the brain um, improved cardiorespiratory measures after the practice. Um, I don't have the rest, but essentially what they found is that it reduced the tendency of people to over breathe. So when we, when we start to slow down our breath, all of you probably noticed it, uh, you, you took a much bigger breath, right? To compensate for that slower breathing rate. That's completely natural and normal, but sometimes we actually overshoot. So we overcompensate and end up breathing too heavily. And that can be take away from some of the benefits. So um, what they found is that introduction of mindfulness helped reduce that. It also led to a slightly lower heart rate than slow breathing without the mantra. Um, and so it basically just seemed like a nice complimentary practice where slow breathing was, you know, we, we saw earlier, slow breathing improved executive function. Uh, it improves our heart rate variability and all these cool things that actually help us be more mindful. And then at the same time, adding the mindfulness we know uh, is now helping the slow breathing. It's helping to reduce heart rate slightly and reduce our chance of over breathing. So they're kind of like a nice complementary uh, merging of two, you know, well-established, 
used for millennia, uh, mind body practices with slow breathing and a mindfulness uh, meditation. So the way we practice this in uh, the easy, the, no simple way would be to just do what we did at the very beginning with the breathing in and breathing out, saying that with each breath you take, breathing in, breathing out in your head, of course, or you can pick a emotionally meaningful or just neutral word, uh, maybe like peace or love or anything that, you know, brings up good feelings or neutral feelings for you. So um, it's that simple. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I have I have a few I use for myself, but uh, like, for example, one is uh, I'll say be the change like I, I want to embody the things I want to help people, you know, I want to be the change I want to see in this world. And so uh, it's cheesy, right? But no one has to know that I share it with you out of transparency, but no one has to know what you're what you're saying, uh, as long as it means something to you, or you can just pick the breathing in breathing out. Um, and so you focus on and silently repeat that word during that slow breathing practice we just did. And finally, you match it to the length of each inhale and exhale. So if you were doing, let's say, a single word like peace, it would be in your head, you'd be thinking, peace, peace, you know, you'd be drawing it out. So it matches the whole length. And that's helping you be extra mindful, right, to the full duration of that breath, rather than just just right when the bell changes and then you kind of let your mind wander and then the bell changes, you let your mind wander. This helps keep it in. Um, so yeah, that it's that simple. Uh, pick an, a word or, or use breathing in, breathing out, focus on it and extend it to match the length of the inhale and exhale. So that is what you will hear in the final practice we're about to do. Um, but with that, I'll just, you know, summarize. This is what we've talked about. Uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, talking about mindful breathing, um, how it affects uh, our attention, uh, changing the cortical thickness of that gray matter and the brain functioning. We talked about nasal breathing and alternate nostril breathing. And then lastly here, slow breathing um, and now combining slow breathing with mindfulness. And so the 12 minute practice uh, that you'll be doing now has three simple ingredients. It's just alternate nostril breathing, the slow breathing with the mindfulness, the, the, uh, the focus where we just discussed. 12 minutes is chosen because across multiple different areas of research from uh, Herbert Benson's work with the relaxation response that he he discovered to people looking at blood pressure, to people looking at uh, meditation and, and attention spans, they found about 10 to 12 minutes is the, the minimum effective dose to see meaningful changes. So you know, if you do 12 minutes a day, you might not be floating on the clouds, you know, in a Zen, Zen state all day, but you will see meaningful improvements. And so I try to keep things as, uh, as, as, as minimal as possible for my own life because I'm busy and I know everyone else is. So it's a simple practice, 12 minutes uh, to see meaningful improvements. So I will invite all of you now to either uh, find a comfortable seated position, or if you would like to lie down, that is completely okay. If you're seated, you know, generally you just want a straight back. Um, you don't want to be hunched over because that makes it harder to expand your lungs. And remember that this is your practice, right? If at any point it doesn't feel right or it feels uncomfortable, just stop. And, and you know, the whole point of this is to help you to be, to feel better and to, to uh, relax some and reduce stress. So it should never feel like a burden. And if it does, just stop. Um yeah. Okay. With that, I will play it. It's a, and then this recording will be provided to you. Um, I'll give it to Angelia and then we can figure out how you can get it uh, after this. So I will go ahead and begin. Come into a comfortable position, either lying down or sitting with a straight back. Take a moment to settle comfortably into this position. Now use your right thumb to close your right nostril and exhale through your left. Now inhale through your left and exhale through your right. Inhale through your right and exhale through your left. 
Inhale left. Exhale right. Inhale right. Exhale left. Inhale left. Exhale right. Inhale right. Exhale left. Continue with this alternate nostril breathing, matching your inhales and exhales to the tones. Now release your hand and breathe in and out through both nostrils. Breathe in and breathe out. Inhale and exhale. Now bring to mind your focus word and concentrate fully on that word during each inhale and exhale for the remainder of the practice. And when your mind wanders, just say to yourself, oh well and come back to your focus word.
Now take a moment to relax and enjoy the benefits of this practice. Thank yourself for taking the time to use your breath to support your brain health. That concludes this session. Have an awesome day. All right. Yay, thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. So thank fascinating. You. I will stop sharing. Thank you for, mm. for your time. And I'm mm. excited to take any questions or thoughts. I have a question. Yes. Um, Nick, um, how does mindfulness relate to your treatment of diabetes? Oh, that's... I was about it, to ask the same question. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful question. It's honestly one of the best things for it um, in two ways. One is like noticing changes, right? That's what mindfulness kind of is, is paying attention. And so like, I'll, I'll give you a, a concrete example. When I do my breathing practice in the morning, a lot of times I lay down and sometimes I sit up. Um and I noticed like hours later that it changes my blood sugar and it took mindfulness, paying attention to different changes to notice, oh, when I lie down, my blood sugar spike doesn't go up as high uh, as when I sit down from, from cortisol, from the morning, early cortisol, not from the breathing itself. Um, and so it's been, a, it's allowed me to adjust for those changes and basically have better control. But the biggest one is mindfulness teaches, um, you know, I, I just taught it as like, say, oh, well, right. Just say, oh, well, but really it's like a, a cultivation of like non-judgmental attitude of acceptance of, of self-compassion. And so when I do mess up or when things do go wrong, I don't beat myself up as much anymore, which has like been the most helpful, like just accept, okay, I met like my blood sugar went off and, uh, now I can, can just do what I need to do to, to move forward. So those have been probably off the top of my head, the two biggest ones. I'm sure there's a lot of other ones, but but thank you for asking. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Any others? Any other thoughts or now's the time, people. <laughs> you can always send them later or yeah, email me. I'm a bit, I'm always around. I like that nasal breathing. Okay. You taught, you taught us that, Angelina. And I, it's well, yeah, but when you explained it, it makes sense how it increases your your brain potential. And uh, yeah. Cool. I'm going to start doing that more now. Awesome. That's yeah. great to hear. I uh, have a question for Angelina. Are you going to um, post this on your Facebook page or will it be in Messenger or what? I'm going to post it on to the Breath Lady Project page, and it will also be available underneath the Wellness um, After Stroke page. Um, and if you guys um, want a copy, I will certainly send you all a copy. I have absolutely no problem doing that for all of you. I do. I want one. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. What a great presentation, Nick. Thank you yeah. so much for such vital information. And I just appreciate the way that you give that science view into this to expand people's understanding of how, how this can be such a complementary piece of your healing journey. You know, your healing journey is going to look like many different things. And it's almost like you're going to have to layer things on top of each other, depending on what is happening in your unique circumstance? So this, I, I just appreciate so much the way that you um, laid it out for everybody to have a firmer grasp on what we're doing here in the practices that we hold together. So this was Thank awesome. You. Thank you so very much. And that, that was uh, a perfect way of putting it, complimentary. It just adds on to anything else, right? It doesn't replace anything, but it's a really nice way to unstress our minds and uh and improve our our health so thank okay. you for having me really really enjoyed it this thank was you. Thank you so much thank you so much for giving us your time both of you we appreciate it so much as always
Yeah. No yeah. problem. Everybody, sure. I'm going to take a quick I'll... little picture. So yeah. give me big smiles. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, Winnie, you have a question? Yes, I have a question. What if when you wake up, you know, before you even wake up, you sneeze and all that. And then what if you have a stuffy nose? What are you supposed to do before you even do this practice? So that's a, a great question. It depends on the, the extent of it, right? If it's really stuff, like if you're sneezing and then just, I would say, Practice some mindfulness of your breath, however it is coming in and out, right? And just use that time for mindfulness rather than uh, any specific breath exercise. There, if it's if you can breathe, so my my coach uh, Patrick McEwen, he says if you can breathe through your nose for a minute, you can breathe through your nose forever. So you could do that test, you know, if you, if you can make it for a minute, then uh, just try to you could try to force it to happen basically, and the nose is a use it or lose it. So the more you use it, the more it opens up. And if you don't use it, um, there's been, there was the, the author, James Nestor, he, he plugged his nose for a week and all sorts of weird bacteria grew and all this, this stuff happened that clogged it up even more. So, uh, but when he, when he, you know, started breathing through it again, it, it, it opened up quickly. So, um, use it or lose it. So the more you use it, the more it will be able to open. But yeah, I just try to say, use, use your best judgment. Don't over force anything. Don't make it hurt or be uncomfortable. But, um, but if you can get the air in and out, then maybe do it for like just five minutes instead of 12 or, you know, whatever you can make it happen. I have a problem when I'm sleeping. So I've got chronic sinusitis. Okay. So when I'm sleeping, my nose is just filling up with mucus, and that's where I'm having most of the problems. Because in my sleep, I'm forced to split, mm. like, breathe open mouth during the day. I can control it, but I've got no idea how I can actually beat it until I can get something to clear my nose up. Yeah, there's a few things like um that help with nasal breathing at night. There's Again, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. Everyone's a little different, right? But there's like these mandibular advancement devices that will kind of push your lower jaw forward a little bit, which pushes your tongue up against the roof of your mouth, which encourages nasal breathing. So it kind of keeps your mouth closed. There's simple old like mouth tape. You'll probably see that all over the internet now. People tape in their mouth. Um that that yeah. can be helpful. Just do it safely, um, you know. Um, yeah, I've got the tape. The problem is, is my nose completely fills up with stuff when I'm lying back. So mm. but the tape eventually gets to a point where I just can't breathe. Yeah. Okay. I um, wonder if you elevated yeah. your body some, if that would assist in, like, maybe elevate your torso up as you sleep for a little while until your body can become more accustomed to breathing in and out of the nose. That's a good, that's a good thought. Or, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, th there's like, n there's nasal uh, rinses you can buy now that will like, you know, maybe right before bed doing a, a salt water rinse of your nose might clear it out enough to let you get to sleep. Maybe even if it's just two hours before you have to take the mouth tape off, you get at least two good hours of sleep before it refills something like yeah. that but or you know the last thing would be to see a see a physician and see if there is something some sort of you know problem you need to get addressed that they could you yeah, know they, they did offer me a surgery but it's the surgery would be so close to my eye that there's a yeah. potential for blindness and it's yeah. like yeah i want to be able to see or breathe better like it's <laughs> I agree with that assessment. So, uh, okay. you're no left a good choice. So, I just went with I'll choose eyesight for at least the first wee while. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's I mean, saving, the, the, that saving rinse is a great suggestion, actually. Um, I don't know if you've ever attempted that, Gary, but um, it's a saline wash that you use to rinse out your sinuses. And once you begin doing that regularly, it will actually help keep things clear for you. That might yeah. be a possibility. I want to try it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you can buy like, you know, them made for it. Um, 
there's also like the more ancient neti pot approach where like you, you know you pour it through one nose and out the other but i think they make things that make it much easier now where you can just boop, boop, then be done with it so yeah just, yeah awesome you know what i do angelina you, I, I when i'm in the shower you take some soap and you wash the inside of your nose out. There you go. And then you take the shower and wash it and rinse it out. And then you blow it and it's nice and clean. Mm. I, I found that's helpful. I don't I don't mm. know, it sounds kind of crazy, but it seems to be working. Something uh -huh. simple like that. You know, mm. it's um, it can blow my nose. It doesn't stay permanently blocked, but the stuff just regenerates so quickly. Uh, mm. You may you may need some kind of a you may have some type of allergy then. It's chronic sinusitis. There's a hole somewhere in my nose that can't get the chance to heal. So it's constantly mm. producing stuff it kind of shouldn't be. And mm. it never mm. gets the rest to heal. I would highly recommend uh, Patrick McEwen. He he had asthma and chronic sin sinusitis also. Um, he almost completely corrected it with like these uh reduced breathing techniques and all the you know a lot of breathing that's why he wrote the book the oxygen advantage and all he got super into it uh because of the the profound impact so you might google his name patrick McEwen, um and, and look there because he has a wealth of information on that topic particularly i've actually uh, sent information to you already gary <laughs> yeah is that the stuff that you've sent to me i <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it's, you got to say, yeah, the, the title of the book was familiar. I didn't recognize the name, but I recognized the title. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I need to head out because I need to go to my sister's before I get my next meeting. So I will see everybody later. See you later, man. Bye-bye. Yeah. Well, everybody, thank you so much for coming. This was fantastic. I think this was a thank great... You, wealth of information that really helps uh this group um understand this a little bit deeper and i can't wait till next week and to see all you beautiful faces <laughs> thank you all so much for having me and for, for everybody the, the have warm. A yes thank you sure everybody have a great week bye-bye bye thanks nick